drivers park faster, relieving stress, and improving urban mobility. We have two great presenters today. We have Mark Pendergrass, who's the Director of Product Management here at Inrix, and we also have Dan McKinney, who's the Principal at Transpo Group, who is an Inrix partner. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items I want to go through. Everyone on the call is muted, and you will be throughout the webinar. But if you have a question, go ahead and submit those through the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar question pane that's on your screen, and we will answer every single question through to the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording within 24 hours of this presentation. You'll have it at, um, available to you. We'll also put it up on our website. Now, without any further ado, I will turn the presentation over to our first presenter, which is Mark Pendergrass. Good morning, good evening, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is Mark Pendergrass here at INRIX. I'll be excited uh, uh, to show you guys over the next uh, couple minutes um, uh, an overview of a new product and service that uh, INRIX is bringing to market um, revolving around parking, specifically on-street parking. I'll be doing this together with uh, one of our partners, uh, Dan McKinney from um, local company here in Seattle, Transpo Group, and he'll be uh, complimenting and adding a, uh, another perspective here. But let's uh, go ahead and jump into the presentation and, and walk you through what we're talking about today and, and more importantly, why we're focusing on parking. Um, as most people know, um, Inrix is best known uh, today as a, as a traffic data company, but um, clearly traffic is only one part of the overall um, uh, solution that Inrix brings to its customers. Um, Namely, what we're trying to do overall is, is, is improve urban mobility and improve solutions for um, our customers, whether they be uh, drivers um, or public sector customers, in terms of solving those urban mobility challenges. Parking is clearly one of the top urban mobility challenges, specifically in larger cities where congestion is very high and space for parking is at a premium. When you look at some of the pain points that drivers face today, for example, it's clear why INRIX is focusing on this issue. First off, it's something that you, know, you and I face very regularly as we go into a city center. It takes quite a bit of time for an average user. In fact, studies have shown that it takes upwards of 20 minutes for that average user to find a parking space um, in an urban environment on the street. And Drivers also admit that you know, when they're frustrated with parking, in fact, a large percentage, large majority of them, over 60%, admit to abandoning their search for on-street parking spaces and looking for alternatives or not parking at all and potentially driving away. And when you look at also the, the lost time and productivity for the individual driver, add, it can add up to quite a bit of, uh, of lost time. In fact, studies have shown that upwards of 55 hours is, is how much the average driver uh, waste every year looking for parking. That's a lot of searching the blocks, going around in circles, looking for parking. In fact, it's almost uh, as long as it takes to get to, to drive from Berlin to, to Lisbon and back. So it's clearly a, a significant issue for drivers um, that you face on a, on a daily basis. And we know we can help solve some of these issues um, for, uh, for the average driver. Now, when you step back and look at what the overall impact is for the city, it too is potential is very damaging. Um, uh, many studies have shown that, a and, and some, one of the reasons why INREX is focused on this market, is that a, a large chunk of traffic in an urban environment, in fact, um, close to 30% of it, is caused by drivers specifically looking for parking and on-street parking. So these are the people circling the blocks, trying to find that on-street parking space. All that does is add to congestion in an urban environment. And then when you look at the, the average uh, uh, cost to the city of these people circling blocks, it can add up to quite a bit of money as well. On average, it costs the city $600 million on an annual basis um, uh, in terms of lost productivity uh, and fuel uh, expense um, for those local economies. Now, there are some cities where it's actually much worse than $600 million. And you can imagine that those are the cities that are most congested. Um, and we report on that every year and as part of our INRIX scorecard. So there's a clear correlation between traffic congestion and that's causing economic pain for those cities. Now, we think that there is an actual solution for all this. Um, just like we approached traffic 10 years ago, we think that we can bring the same kind of data-driven analytics and um, real-time information to drivers. 
And that's why we're very excited to introduce our on-street parking solution. Now, naturally, um, on-street is just one part of the overall solution for parking in an urban environment. What we want to do is bring a comprehensive solution to drivers in those urban environments. We clearly want to help them find all the parking options, regardless of type, whether they're on street or off street, um, above ground, below ground, private and public. We also want to allow them to quickly compare their options, all seamlessly in their car, in terms of prices, location, availability, etc. All that stuff we think we can bring to the, to the car environment and to the mobile phone environment. And lastly, to make this a truly seamless experience for drivers, we also want to eventually bring payment capabilities into the car as well or to the mobile device. So it's a completely seamless find, compare, and pay solution for our customers. So, Inrix Parking Service, as I mentioned, is, is more than just on-street parking. It builds on top of an existing product and service that we've been bringing to the market over the last couple years. Um, in fact, we've had an off-street parking uh, solution uh, in market for nearly two years now, providing access to and information to 80,000 lots across the world in um, all the major countries in Europe and North America and, and beyond, um, with prices and availability and information. What we're announcing today, then, is a complement to that service we have in market, which provides on-street parking information to drivers as well. And as I touched on earlier, this clearly is just one step in the broader evolution of our parking service. Um, we uh, would aim and, and, and see vision in bringing transaction capability into the car and mobile device experience as well. But that, again, is coming in the future. Today, it's all about extending our information to, to drivers and, and, and our automotive car companies into the on-street parking space. So let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by this on-street parking service and making it complete uh, and providing that end-to-end uh, -end information. We'll start with what uh, I would term static data. This is key information on a block-by-block -block basis that provides uh, coordinates for um, where drivers can park in a, in a city environment. Where are the legal parking spaces? What are the pricing rates, for example? What are relevant restrictions? All of that is very useful information to a driver as they enter um, an urban city and, and want to know where can they legally park, ideally to uh, minimize any fines that they might get. Complementing that static data, of course, which generally doesn't change too much during the course of, of a year, um, is the dynamic data, or more specifically, occupancy information, also on a block-by-block -block basis. This is most useful for a driver to find information on where they can have the highest likelihood of finding availability for parking their car on a city block. Now, naturally, this is going to be more than just a snapshot in a particular time. We also want to be able to provide a predicted experience for them, too. So if a driver is entering a urban environment, say in two hours according to their routing, um, we want to be able to surface what kind of uh, parking availability would they see when they get to the city in, in that time frame. Now a good way to sort of explore and, and showcase the, the value of, uh, of that on-street parking occupancy, what I'd like to just pause in my presentation and show you is a, a very short video on um, what we did specifically uh, as a case study in San Francisco, um, one of the cities that's been cooperating with us in terms of exploring what can we do around um, on-street parking um, occupancy. So I'll move away from my PowerPoint here. Hopefully everyone can get to and see on screen here my short video. Um, and what I'm going to be showing you guys over the next uh, minute is a visualization, a 3D visualization of parking occupancy um, coming out of our uh, occupancy model, and I'll talk about that in just a, a couple minutes, um, and in 3D, showing block by block, in fact, meter by meter occupancy uh, changes um, in key neighborhoods in San Francisco um, that vary over time. In fact, we looked at a, a two and a half day time period here, uh, spanning from Thursday to about midday Saturday, and you'll see that parking occupancy actually varies quite a bit between neighborhoods and also over time within a neighborhood. So hopefully everyone can see here, uh, we're zooming in on a particular neighborhood around the City Hall area of San Francisco, um, approaching Thursday afternoon, and you see uh, a, a quite a bit of fluctuation within city blocks and across the neighborhood. And as time flows, 
you see that occupancy goes into the red, that's the highest of, uh, occupancy, and then in the evening hours, obviously, and, and overnight, it drops down to the green, or lowest um, uh, occupancy. Um, that obviously changes during the course of the day when you look at Friday, and then when you zoom into another very highly congested area in San Francisco, the Mission District, you'll see that there are different patterns occurring here. Mission District, if people have been to San Francisco, is very much a mixed residential and uh, commercial uh, uh, area. So during a typical Saturday, there's obviously quite a bit of activities. People run their errands and, and go from shop to shop uh, getting their, uh, their chores done. Now, during the, I'll just pause here um, just for a second, just to point out one little point here. Um, oops, there we are. During the course of an evening, for example, on a Saturday at around 10 o'clock, you'd see highest congestion or highest occupancy clustered around the entertainment areas within that, within that area. Uh, whether it's restaurants or nightclubs, clearly the areas around those generate the highest occupancy according to our model. Now, only a couple blocks away, you'll notice that there is particularly low occupancy, right? About um, around 16th uh, Street, if I'm not mistaken, there is an area of low occupancy um, showing by the green bars here. Now, if a driver knew that there was uh, an area not too far away from them where they'd have a much higher chance of finding parking, that would provide them with obviously quite a bit of information to help them get to their destination much quicker. So there we have it in terms of what this occupancy data could look like on a 3D model. But naturally, we think that there's quite a bit of value for the automotive companies as well, in terms of how this could be surfaced inside of a navigation uh, dashboard. Um, we offer a number of advantages for OEMs, and what we sh we're showing here is a mock-up, obviously, of, of how this information could, could represent itself within a navigation screen. Most importantly, that we give OEMs uh, access to, to, to the raw data itself, and we give them plenty of display options in terms of how to surface this information within their navigation screen. Whether they want to um, place the, the occupancy information on their map, or whether they want to use a, a pre-generated map um, that INREX could provide to them, those are all options for the OEMs, regardless of, of, of choice of map, um, regardless of, uh, of, of uh, of, of how they want to display it on the screen. We also, of course, offer our automotive customers the ability to provide a white label solution, right? So this is clearly something we want to enable our customers to put under their brand name inside of their navigation screen. We also offer significant coverage as well. I'll cover that in a couple minutes, um, but our solution is more than a one city approach. We're launching, of course, with a, a, a smaller set of cities, uh, uh, six of them. I'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Um, but we have uh, uh, goals in place to, to dramatically expand that coverage over the next uh, uh, several months and years. And actually, of course, just as with our other services, whether it's parking or traffic, we also offer automotive customers one global integration point, one set and consistent API that they can use uh, regardless of where their, their cars or customers are. So quite a few options here and advantages for the automotive industry and something that's available for them to use as of today. All this information has uh, fallen on some very receptive ears. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, we were proud to announce that BMW um, is uh, going to be our first uh, customer using this data um, in a future model. Um, we don't have information specifically on when and where. That's, uh, you'll be hearing more information from BMW. Um, but this is clearly an area that is getting lots of uh, attention within OEMs, and BMW, again, is showing that it's ahead of the curve and bringing something truly innovative into the market. So we're excited to be partnering with, it, with BMW and building this initial uh, service together with them. Now, I mentioned global coverage earlier, and some a little bit, a uh, couple other uh, additional details on that. Our launch cities that we are uh, introducing to the market uh, this month include Seattle, San Francisco, Vancouver, BC, Amsterdam, Cologne, and Copenhagen. As you, many of uh, you in the industry are, uh, are probably aware, um, several of these cities have a very uh, extensive open data platform that uh, INREX is, is leveraging and using. Um, and we're very uh, appreciative of the fact that cities increasingly are moving down that path and sharing data with developers like INREX that can then provide value to, uh, to their citizens in the market. We have a target of uh, expanding this, uh, this on-street parking coverage into 23 cities um, by the end of the year, 
and um, our goal is to double that uh, year over year as we roll into 2016 and 2017. So from the get-go, we are approaching this as a truly global product spanning uh, both the key markets uh, of Europe and North America. So let's quickly touch into how this uh, uh, particular solution works. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cities with their open data platforms are a key source of data for our, our static uh, information that we'll be relaying on to our automotive customers. This includes information such as parking maps and parking restrictions, um, rates information by block. That, that information is extremely useful and um, increasingly is available through open data platforms like the city in San Francisco, uh, Seattle, Amsterdam. Many of these cities are starting to move down that path and enabling uh, customers and, and partners like Inrix to, to bring this to market. Uh, another key source of data um, uh, providing us with insight into uh, occupancy models on the, on the dynamic side include payment information, so transaction information from, from partners such as uh, Park Mobile, Pay by Phone, and, 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 and many others. Um, this clearly gives us a very good snapshot of where people are parking meter by meter or parking zone by parking zone, as well as information on how long they stay and um, uh, what those uh, trends are over time. So this is a very important use of, of historical and real-time information. Now speaking of real-time real information, we also are uh, leveraging important information from our own traffic probes uh, coming from our 250 million plus connected vehicles um, or that are uh, available throughout the world. This information provides to us with useful uh, trend analysis around where people start and end their trips. All of this data, of course, is, a, is captured uh, anonymously, but Inrix looks at the big picture and, and looks at where people are starting their trips, ending their trips, and this gives us a good indication for what parking occupancy is like over the course of the non-transactable hours. So transaction data is very useful for providing us with insight um, between, let's say, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Clearly, we want to offer our customers a 24-hour view of parking occupancy. Real-time probe data coming from our connected vehicle fleets gives us that ability to extend beyond the 8 to 6 p.m. hour and offer information on occupancy um, in uh, weekends as well as holidays and, of course, evening hours. And the third uh, uh, real-time source of data will be information coming from either mobile devices or maybe even from uh, connected uh, real-time uh, car sharing fleets as well. So you'll hear more information about this uh, over the next, uh, over the next couple, couple months. So clearly we see where this data is coming from. Cities providing static data as a base layer for uh, the, uh, the information around rates and restrictions and locations and uh, a number of different real-time and, and transactional sources providing insight into parking occupancy and thus availability. We see, obviously, quite a bit of interest uh, in the end customers being um, automotive OEMs who can pull in both those static and dynamic data. And then, naturally, there will be another uh, set of customers that are very interested in looking at the overall historical trends and the analysis coming from, from that uh, historical data. And you'll hear more about that in a couple minutes. Speaking of which, that historical trends and information has value beyond just automotive. It also has interesting in, uh, impact on uh, city planners as well. In fact, that's one of the key reasons why Enrix mm -hmm. is looking at this market, in that we know that uh, the current solutions out there for city planners are often inadequate or are also very difficult to, to scale. They have use and utility, of course, but in terms of bringing this kind of occupancy model on a wide basis to a city, it does pose some challenges. First off, many of them offer high maintenance costs in terms of maintaining uh, physical hardware in the ground or, or in the air. They can uh, prove costly to install um, and, 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 and service over a long term. And they also, uh, because they're physical hardware, are, are difficult, more difficult to, to roll out on a, on a city-wide basis. We think a big data approach uh, from Inrix and, and our partners can complement these existing solutions in the market and offer a way for city to, to, to get insight and data on a much broader basis and a, and a broader time frame. So what are those benefits for cities? I'll just touch on four of them and, and then I'll um, uh, introduce uh, Dan McKinney from Transpo. Obviously, having information on a real-time basis, whether that's from, uh, from uh, traffic probes, 
or from our occupancy information is very useful for a city. We also see uh, as cities uh, uh, evolve and, and, and bring into um, uh, bring into use uh, real-time data um, from companies like Inrex, there's less reliance then on physical hardware and costly sensors in, uh, in the ground or on site of buildings. This information also provides uh, some in useful insight uh, as cities move towards dynamic pricing models for their on-street parking. Um, many people have seen uh, this in the news recently um, uh, in many cities across the globe. Um, as cities increasingly optimize for uh, a, a target occupancy level, this often uh, means that uh, there is a need to change pricing during the course of a day um, to, to, to achieve those occupancy models. Having uh, data and, and occupancy trends from INRIX can help them calibrate that model um, to target and, and achieve that uh, target occupancy. And actually, pulling all this inf insight together, um, we see this information as having better insight for those urban planners over the long haul. But I've done enough talking, and I'd like to turn over now to my, uh, our counterpart and, and valued INRIX partner, um, Dan McKinney from the Transfo Group, who can shed some insight on how this data could provide uh, uh, useful information to cities in particular. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Mark. Uh, yeah, my name is Dan McKinney. And, um, a principal and owner at the uh, Transpo Group and kind of have a specialty focus on parking. Um, just to give you a little background, Transpo is kind of a transportation planning and engineering consulting firm with offices along the west coast of the U.S. as well as in the Middle East and Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Saudi Arabia. Um, we're frequently asked by agencies and organizations to help them evaluate and monitor parking and come up with solutions that best optimize their use of that valuable asset. Um, I've got 20 years of experience in the U.S. and abroad, and uh, pretty excited to be working with Indrix to find out how we can best utilize this new tool. Um, parking is kind of an interesting component to transportation planning, and um, we see parking uh, as a really a key component of that multimodal system. It's a very valuable asset that we think needs to be managed, and uh, managing that can help your overall transportation goals and objectives. So in doing so, we like to use a data-driven process for evaluating, discovering, managing, analyzing, and then communicating that information to customers. Um, as part of that data-driven approach um, leads to making decisions that eliminate some of the guesswork. Oftentimes, we do, if we don't know enough information, we're lead, led to guessing and testing different things without really understanding how effective those solutions are going to be. So as part of that discovery process, we're trying to understand and learn how are our parking assets being used? Um, who's parking where? How are, how are the different areas being utilized? And if we are aware of that, we can start making different decisions on how to manage that. Um, and managing it gives us a clear understanding of really where we want to make different decisions and implement, implement different strategies to balance out the use of that asset. Um, and really, it's, it's really driven by how we want to best manage the communicating that information to meet our goals and objectives. And analyzing it, as we get more and more information and data from these models, we're able to see and analyze what is really happening when we implement different strategies. So if we're making pricing changes, hourly adjustments, or other uh, strategies, we can actually see how effective those strategies are and able to balance and, and make adaptions as we move out into the future. And really importantly is how do we communicate this information? If people aren't aware or drivers aren't aware of where available parking is at, we're not going to be as successful as uh, meeting our overall transportation goals and balancing the needs of different modes. So in using different 3D models, uh, navigation systems, and other ways to communicate this, we're really going to get the information out to the people and the drivers in the best way possible. Um, and so this is really all driven by uh, performance-based parking strategies of how to best manage and optimize um, information. And if we're able to use big data and other local data to best do this, we're going to have a better optimum system. Because really some of the benefits is we're really optimizing the valuable asset of parking and, and better managing it. So we don't have to build um, huge parking structures and extra costly assets to um, balance that out. We can actually manage it what we have available. We're going to improve customer experiences. The more, the, the more people are aware of where parking is at, the more, via, the, more, um, the more likely they are to come to your downtown area or to your area to spend money and um, keep coming back. 
that's where that economic vitality comes into play. If businesses have available on-street parking or available parking near them, people are going to be able, customers are going to be able to experience and, and visit them more frequently and spend more money. Um, supporting sustainability goals is another feature. If we are able to navigate people directly to their parking spaces, we're having less time circulating for parking, um, less emissions and um, other um, aspects of the environment, and really balance out that multimodal system. And then reducing the need for costly infrastructure is pretty important. There's different ways to communicate and get information to people through sensors, digital guidance systems, but this is just another tool that's really going to help um, guide and navigate people to their areas um, more frequently. Thank you, Dan. appreciate that. So as a quick summary of, of the value we think this uh, solution brings to both uh, the automotive industry as well as um, the public sector, um, let's go over, go over some of the key benefits. Obviously, from the driver perspective, um, it's, it's helping them shorten the time it takes uh, for them to find their parking spaces. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the presentation, um, uh, drivers on average spend about 20, min 20 minutes finding on-street parking um, in the densest urban environments. Uh, by providing them with this guidance to uh, very tactically as to uh, where the availability is uh, in their neighborhood block by block, um, we see that uh, this information is being a key way to shorten that time wasted going around. In and obviously, by helping them find their parking spaces, this reduce, reduces their overall driver frustration. Um, and, uh, and improve their enjoyment uh, of, of, of driving. Um, as you reduce the amount of time uh, people spend looking for parking, the, this has a direct correlation, of course, with city traffic itself, um, which uh, clearly all urban environments are trying to, to, to mitigate. Um, and uh, and as, as, as Dan and I touched on earlier, um, it also offers uh, a way for cities to more cost-effectively manage their overall parking inventory um, on an ongoing basis. Clearly, this is one of many tools the city would have uh, at their disposal to do that. Um, we're uh, obviously just a component of the overall solution, um, but we see it as a, as a key uh, potential insight um, uh, and tool for the cities uh, or, or over the long haul. And then um, lastly, uh, to achieve their, their target occupancy levels, um, which is often a mandate for uh, most city governments, um, we see uh, this information as being a, a valuable asset in helping them uh, manage their uh, dynamic pricing models um, for on-street parking um, occupancy and that overall inventory. So at a high level, these are the, the key benefits for, for drivers and cities, um, and we're very excited to, to be uh, introducing this service and, and working with our automotive and, and public sector uh, customers um, over the next uh, months and years. So, with that, I think we're, we're concluding the slide presentation of our, uh, uh, of our webinar, and we'd like to open it up for, for questions. I think a number of people have already sent us uh, some questions um, uh, via email. I encourage people to, to do that uh, as well. Um, we may not have time to get through all the questions, so we should be uh, very clear uh, with that um, exp uh, expectations, um, but let's, uh, let's do as, as, as much as we can here. Um, so um, I'll go ahead and read some of the questions uh, online, and between Dan and I, I think we'll, we'll do our best to, to, to tackle them. Okay, so uh, let's, let's address one, one quick question here. How is on-street parking occupancy data collected? Um, uh, that's a relatively easy one to, to, to answer. Our model actually calculates parking occupancy. It's not a collection of occupancy data, it's a calculation of data. And as I described earlier, what we're doing is, is fusing a number of different sources of data um, to come and arrive at that calculation. Um, it includes, of course, uh, historical transaction data. It includes real-time um, uh, traffic probes from our connected vehicles. Um, it includes uh, uh, mobile uh, sensors as well from mobile sens uh, cell phones and other uh, mobile providers. Um, and we envision additional sources being added over time. So you'll hear more about us, uh, our efforts to improve the quality and coverage uh, of our service. But this diffusion of, of distinct data points um, um, and intelligent analysis of the data points that allows us to calculate um, the, the parking occupancy, again, on a block-by-block -block basis. 
Um, let's uh, target another question. Um, in regards to the San Francisco data, um, how, how, how does NREX account for occupancy given that the sens uh, city turned off uh, its uh, sensors um, and there is also uh, a high level of exempt parking uh, permits uh, that are being used um, across the city? Um, those are actually two separate questions, so I'll tackle, uh, I'll tackle them both. Um, first off, uh, in regards to the sensor data, um, obviously the sensor data available on SF Park Open Data website was a very valuable tool for NREX to help uh, uh, validate and, and provide ground truth comparatives for our model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our model calculates uh, occupancy information uh, on a block-by-block -block basis. The ground truth data from the sensors were useful in helping us calibrate that over time. And we looked at, obviously, uh, uh, we compared our output with, um, uh, with what the model um, was, was telling us from, from the sensors. And so the, having that ground truth uh, comparative was, in fact, very useful um, to help us uh, arrive at a, at a benchmark for, for, the, for the city but we don't have a need for the sensors moving forward, given that those are, sensors are indeed turned off as of, I believe, 2013. So it's, it's a great uh, benchmarking exercise to, to help us uh, arrive at a, a good calibration, um, but they're no longer needed on an ongoing basis since we're doing the calculation using real-time data moving forward. Now, the second part of the question, Matt, um, is, is also very uh, interesting, and that uh, is related to the exempt uh, parking um, uh, situations, which is, is common not just to San Francisco, but to, to many cities across the world. It's as much of an issue uh, in Europe uh, as it is in the United States. Um, and the way our data and model accounts for that are a couple ways. One of them, of course, is that our real-time uh, uh, real traffic probe data um, is obviously agnostic as to whether or not you have a parking permit or not. So we're able to, to know uh, at a macro level uh, whether you're, you're starting your, your trip or ending your trip uh, at a particular parking zone in a, in a, in a city. Um, so that, is, that again, is, is, is data that doesn't matter whether you have uh, exemption or not. Um, so if we were to rely only on transaction data, I would say that's uh, definitely a, a, uh, an issue uh, they would have to uh, account for. But given that we're complementing transaction data with real-time um, uh, traffic probe data, we were able to overcome that, that limitation. Um, naturally, uh, as we learn more and more about uh, cities' behavior, um, clearly there will be some ways to, uh, to, to adjust uh, uh, parking occupancy model on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood basis as we move forward. Um, there are obviously very different behaviors in, in, in neighborhoods that uh, have uh, large hospitals, for example, um, um, compared to residential neighborhoods, which, which obviously have more predictable uh, and standard behaviors over time. So um, that, there will be a certain amount of uh, adjustment in our model on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood on a, on a neighborhood basis and a city-by-city city basis as we learn um, uh, over time. Um, so let's uh, tackle a couple other questions. Um, uh, any statistics for the accuracy of this parking information? Um, what we'll be doing um, as we roll this out is, is doing um, obviously ongoing ground truth testing of our data, of our occupancy model, and sharing that with our customers uh, to, to, to showcase the, the occupancy uh, statistics and, and the accuracy of these, um, leveraging the, the the uh, sensor data from San Francisco, um, our accuracy right now is, is in the mid-80s uh, in terms of uh, accuracy for uh, the occupancy compared to ground truth. Um, we obviously see some uh, uh, ways to improve that further, um, but right now we're, we're, we're using that as our, as our main, uh, main baseline. Um, let's see, if, uh, a couple other questions here. Are you planning to send parking data to navigation devices, and what does this data uh, consist of? Um, the way we'll be doing that uh, through our uh, OEM um, uh, customers, our automotive OEM customers, is a number of different ways. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we're pretty flexible in terms of uh, how to do this. Um, the most basic inf way to do that is expose uh, information on a block-by-block -block basis using um, 
uh, standard uh, polygons or polylines, essentially, providing information um, on the uh, uh, latitude, longitude of the start and the end of um, uh, uh, the start and end of the particular parking block, and then uh, revealing information as well as to the, uh, the restrictions, rates, and then uh, the, the obviously the occupancy at that particular point in time. All of that is is available through uh, a standard XML and soon JSON API um, that our customers can um, can call us in, in real time. And it's ultimately up to our automotive customers in terms of how to display that within the navigation device itself. Some customers may opt to, to place those lines on, on their own maps. Um, um, some customers may opt to, to take our uh, pre-populated uh, occupancy uh, parking tile, um, if you will, just like we do with traffic and use that to, to place on their map as a, uh, as a layer on top of the map um, that already has occupancy and, 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 and information um, uh, pre-included on there. Um, so again, many options for the, uh, for the automotive customers uh, to display this on, a, uh, on their maps. Um, this would be an area, of course, that we'd like to work with the, uh, our customers in more detail and, and walk them through this uh, uh, and, and marry it to, to, to their particular uh, use cases and, uh, and delivery vehicles. Okay. Um, is specific block-by-block -block residential street parking available in the solution? Um, uh, the answer is uh, where we have data uh, uh, available, um, uh, we will be able to, to uh, provide that to our customers. I'll mention that the core focus of our product is in the uh, uh, core commercial districts of uh, city centers um, where there is a, uh, indeed a, a parking problem or the biggest parking problem. That is our core focus. Um, I, I will not be able to guarantee 100% coverage across the city because either the data is not available or we don't have an, um, or uh, the, the data quality is not at the, at the point where we're able to, to, to relay that confidently to a customer. Our core, uh, our core product will be focused on, on commercial districts where parking is the, 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 highest, uh, uh, the highest problem. Um, so that will evolve over time as we gather more data, as we include um, uh, additional uh, uh, sources of information. Um, but for, the, for the, our initial, initial six cities uh, that we launch with, our, our focus will be on uh, the downtown commercial districts. Um, we should also talk about uh, how customers uh, will be able to eventually uh, pay for, uh, uh, for parking transactions. And I'll touch on that at a very high level because, uh, again, this is something that uh, we're not formally announcing with this uh, announcement here today. Um, but the vision that we, would, uh, we have is to enable transactions um, for on-street and off-street parking, all integrated into the service we provide to our uh, automotive customers. So um, given that uh, a car knows where it is in a, in a city center, uh, they know what the, the block that they're parking on, um, it, uh, our vision is to connect those particular data points together um, and enable the transaction seamlessly through that navigation experience. But again, details on, on how and when and where um, uh, this is all going to be enabled uh, will, be, will be forthcoming. Um, we don't have further information on that right now, but it's clearly something that we want to uh, focus on over the course of the next uh, uh, months um, and years. Okay, um, uh, here's a good question. In large cities uh, or urban environments, uh, how does INRIC solve uh, driver location accuracy? Uh, 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 GPS is highly inaccurate. Um, uh, that is an, a very good point. Um, it's something that we're quite familiar with uh, on our traffic side. Um, uh, the, the way that our algorithms account for that is where GPS probes uh, are deemed to be inaccurate or, or of dubious trustworthiness, our, our system actually automatically filters those out. Um, and so we're able to hone in on uh, those uh, uh, traces and particular um, uh, those particular uh, trip, uh, real-time trip probes that are accurate and reflection of, of what's actually happening. So all that can be done by our model in, in real time so that only the, the most highly confident and, and relevant um, uh, parking-related events are, are used in calculating 
um, uh, this particular model. Okay, well, give me a second here or two here to look through uh, a couple of these other questions. Uh, we've got a number of them coming in, which is which is great. Um, a couple of them in terms of uh, one question here was how does the 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 model uh, account for the high level of illegal activity, low payment, um, and then double parking. Um, and I think I covered that earlier. Uh, our, the way we do that is we complement the transaction data that we get uh, with real-time traffic probes from connected vehicles to, uh, to be able to, to, to incorporate uh, actual people uh, in parked cars. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's a way that we, we, we uh, we're able to, to move beyond just people who are paying for parking and incorporate uh, actual vehicles uh, uh, at a particular location. Hey, Mark, I see a question regarding um, how Uber ride sharing and autonomous vehicles may affect um, some of the aspects of parking in the future. That's pretty. Uh, that's a new kind of innovative way to look at how parking is going to be infected, uh, affected, I should say. And a lot of that has to do with modal choice. So as more people have choices for different types of modes and uses, they're going to have um, different options to make better informed decisions. So if you're aware and aware of where available parking is, how congested parking is, and based on the different management tools for pricing and so forth, more and more people are going to be choosing to either not have a vehicle or use more options like ride share. So that does definitely impact um, parking, but specifically we're doing more and more studies in different cities to see how as more ride sharing is implemented in cities, how that specifically impacts different areas. It's best utilized where cities are most congested in parking. So it actually just helps balance out your parking assets a little bit more as you have more choices for transit, um, ride sharing, and autonomous vehicles. I think the autonomous vehicle subject is probably a whole other webinar that we could talk about and we'll uh, we can get in that another time. Great, thank you, Dan. You gave me a, a minute or two also to, to grab a, a, a drink of water. My throat was getting dry. Um, uh, that's a very good point. Where I, where I, I would agree with you. There's definitely um, um, increased use of multimodal uh, transport options within the city. Um, I would say that um, car sharing services, in particular, I think are, are very interesting here in Seattle. It's something that's taken off quite a bit. Um, with car to go already in, in the market and um, and drive now coming soon. Um, uh, clearly, uh, these types of uh, car sharing services are also very, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, would be potential customers for this data as well, given that all of the car sharing um, drivers need to park their car in a, a valid on-street parking space. Um, so uh, this too would be a tool for, for these drivers of these vehicles to, to more quickly find um, uh, 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 not only a legal parking space, but one that, that's actually available. Um, I see a good question here in terms of, uh, can you describe and be more specific about the mid-80s accuracy? What, what exactly is that? Um, and you're right, I, I need to be more uh, clear about what that was. Um, what the mid-80s accuracy represents is the comparison between uh, the output of our occupancy model um, and the percentage of times that it was accurate uh, uh, compared to ground truth testing at that particular time bin. Um, so we looked at uh, hourly time bins across a whole week's worth of data um, you know, um, and split it, uh, all those different time bins into those hourly, uh, sorry, split that, that time period into hourly time bins. We compared uh, the occupancy model um, uh, that comes out of our, uh, our algorithms to the actual ground truth uh, coming up from the, the sensors of SF Park, and we looked at uh, uh, how many of the of the occupancy um, uh, model predictions, uh, and we compared that with what the what the sensors said in real life. So that was a mid 80s percent accuracy um, uh, doing those comparisons um, across all the time bins. Um, uh, across the uh, everywhere where uh, the city of San Francisco had um, had uh, SS uh, SF Park sensors in place, so hopefully that that helps uh, provide uh, some some insight on, on what the, what that was. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, okay, here, a good question here. The SF demo uh, areas 
uh, were uh, only in specific areas and how does this scale out to the whole city, um, which is an excellent question. As I mentioned earlier, the SF Park uh, sensors were extremely valuable for helping us provide uh, ground truth base layer um, uh, in a particular neighborhood and zone. Um, so there's quite a bit of value in, in having that as a, as a baseline. Um, the way we were able to scale that out to, uh, to broader uh, city was that there, there were clear patterns um, in distinct neighborhoods that we were able to apply. Um, so taking the, the um, uh, SF Park neighborhoods and um, extrapolating the behavior from those neighborhoods with our transactions in real-time um, uh, uh, real traffic probe data, we are able to do that on a, on a, on a very scalable fashion. Um, um, and, uh, and expand that beyond, uh, beyond just the, the, the sensor areas. Um, so it's a, together a very smart math, um, as well as uh, detection of clear uh, trends um, in those neighborhoods compared to others uh, across the city. Um, naturally, um, we would uh, obviously love to get more sensor data to use as ground truth in other cities. So, um, uh, that is definitely a, an area for, uh, for future uh, discussion and, um, and expansion. Um, but we are able to, to, to take that data and, 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 and move beyond uh, uh, those neighborhoods. Um, what percentage of vehicles need to have your probes in, in them in order to reasonably uh, provide accurate data? Um, that too is uh, a, a very good uh, question. Um, just like with traffic, uh, it's, in, in, in terms of representing traffic congestion, we don't need 100% um, uh, penetration in a market to be able to accurately reflect uh, traffic flow. Um, in fact, uh, you need a much smaller percentage. In fact, you just need a statistically significant uh, uh, sample set uh, for you to be able to represent what's, what's coming and going um, um, on a city street, whether that's for parking or for traffic. Um, not being a statistician, I'm going to uh, avoid answering the specific question as to uh, what percentage that is, uh, but um, um, that clearly is, is something that, um, that's helping us here with this overall model. Um, so again, we do not need 100% accuracy, or sorry, 100% uh, penetration in, of connected vehicles. We just need a very small sample set. Um, to be able to understand what's going on, um, on on the city streets, whether it's parking or, of course, whether it's traffic congestion as well. Um, Dan, any other questions here that you're seeing I'm, uh, that could be of interest? No, I think building off of what you were just talking about, though, is that um, you know the level of detail in the data really depends on what kind of decisions you're making and what kind of information that you want to disseminate to different people. I think if you're trying to allow people to find where the most likely available parking is, you do not need 100% accuracy of information and minute-by-minute -minute parking statistics. Um, I think of the, the probes and, and data, I should say the sensors and data that you found in San Francisco, very valuable, but oftentimes, you know, knowing exactly where this individual space was wasn't always the most valuable thing for every driver because by the time you got there, that space may have been occupied already. So it's really just identifying where is the best available areas for parking and to better manage um, those different assets, I think, is a, doesn't need to be 100% accurate. Okay. Good. Excellent. So I think these questions have been uh, flowing in uh, quite well, and they're all very good questions, and hopefully we're able to address uh, the points that people have raised. Um, but my, my, uh, my throat is dry, <laughs> and our time is limited. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, I think we're, we're close to finishing out the, the session here. Yeah, so I, I thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and learning more about our, our new services on the market. Um, special thanks to Mark and Dan for sharing their expertise on driver services and urban planning. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, like we mentioned at the beginning of the uh, session, this, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be shared with all of the attendees within 24 hours of, um, of the session, and you will receive it through the GoToWebinar email. So watch for that. And then in the meantime, um, please feel free to visit um, enrix.com. We've got uh, just a wealth of um, additional resources on parking services and you know all the all this traffic and data um, resources that we have at our disposal. So please go ahead and visit our website and, and check that out. Um, again, thank you for joining and um,
have a great day.